Let's just see here. We see you. Perfect. Wonderful. Okay, so I am just going to do a little bit of an introduction here. Uh, my name is Tracy Eman, and I wanted to welcome everyone to ask Candice about addiction recovery. Um, I'm part of the Love With Boundaries team, and today Candice and Christine will be taking questions, very important questions about recovery concepts, such as the difference between enabling and helping, and why self-respecting boundaries are vital. So before we start, let's get some housekeeping tips out of the way. We would love to hear your questions. Please use the Q&A tab beside the chat tab to submit your questions. And you can choose the option to send to admin only. Okay, so you click on the to everyone and then you can choose to to admin. We have had some questions come in via email, so we will be addressing those today as well. And for those of you, this is your first time coming to one of these sessions. I just wanted to give you a little bit of information about Love With Boundaries. So Love With Boundaries offers counseling to help families and the addicts they love come out of the pain and devastation of addiction forever. Our therapists counsel families on how to love with clear and respectful boundaries. And they provide insights and techniques to help families stop enabling the addicts they love so that they can make all they can all make the choice to recover from addiction. All right. I would take like to take this moment to introduce Candace. So Candace Platter is a professional speaker, TEDx speaker, addictions therapist in private practice, and a sought-after leader in the field of addiction. Candace is also the author of the award-winning book, Loving an Addict, Loving Yourself, the top 10 survival tips for loving someone with an addiction. In her unique and signature family addiction counseling and therapy program, she specializes in working with families and other loved ones of people who are struggling with addiction. The results Candace and her team achieves has been astounding. Addicts stop using and families regain their lives from the ravages of addiction. Thank you so much, Candice, uh, for making time to answer these questions today. Sure. All right. Okay. Am I am I on, Tracy? You are on, Candice, yes. I'm on. Okay. So um, my apologies for getting started late. Uh, technology just it just floors me. Can't live with it, can't live without it, kind of thing. Um, so I uh, am wanting to introduce Christine to you. Uh, some of you have spoken to her before by phone when you've been uh, part of Love With Boundaries. And I want to just introduce her because she and I are kind of be, will be talking back and forth for the, um, for the duration. So I'm going to read just a paragraph about Christine, okay? So Christine Zitcher, after spending more than 20 years in the field of human resources and business management, Christine decided to pursue a career helping others overcome their addiction. Christine holds a degree in professional counseling with a focus on family counseling and addictions. She has spent several years working in treatment centers and nonprofits and is excited about being part of the Love With Boundaries team. Christine began her own recovery journey in 2017 and has been clean and sober ever since. Yay. Um, raising her two uh, young boys in Vancouver, BC. So welcome, Christine. Thank you. Um, and I, I think I'm probably not the only one who knows that um, this is the time of year when we all get colds and stuff. Uh, so Christine has had one. She's kind of on the, on the tail end of it now that she can be here with us. I have a sore throat, so you'll see me sucking on lozenges. How are you doing, Tracy? So far, so good, but I've been drinking yeah, okay. tea all morning. <laughs> okay, okay. 
So um, what's going to happen today is that uh, Christine and I will talk about the questions that have been posed to us. We haven't seen them yet. They'll be new to us. Um, and, um, and then about 1.30 or so, or about half an hour from now, depending on what time zone you're in, um, Christine is going to talk about what happens in our free 30-minute uh, consultation that we offer people. So um, she'll she'll be able to maybe put some fears to rest and and um, get get people uh, let people understand what our 30-minute consultation is. So I think that's all um, that I need to say about that. We're we're going to start by talking about the difference between enabling and helping, which is so near and dear to my heart. Um, there's such a difference between those two. And until you really get the flavor of each of them, um, people wind up enabling when they should be helping. So enabling is when you set the bar very low for the addict. Enabling is when you, as the loved one, are doing things for the addict that they can do for themselves and that they should be doing for themselves. So I'll give a couple of examples, just really common examples of enabling, but um, I do want to say that enabling can happen in all kinds of situations. Every once in a while, I hear something new about enabling, like, oh, I haven't heard that before, you know. So there are many, many ways to enable. But what basically you're doing is you're giving up on the addict and the addict's resiliency. You're giving that up. And you're basically telling them through your actions, maybe your words, you're letting them know that you don't really believe in them that much. Um, and so you're going to just, you're just going to keep doing things for them. And when you do that, the addict starts to lose belief in himself or herself. Of course, it goes both ways. Um, and it keeps the addict stuck in addiction. When we enable, we're contributing to keeping the addict stuck in addiction. So um, one example of enabling is when you allow the addict who's still using, I'm not talking about somebody in recovery, the addict is still using, you, you allow him, I'm going to say him probably, but I mean her as well, but you allow him to live in the family home. Uh, and I'm talking about usually an adult addict, but it could also be a teenage person as well. You let them stay in the family home, not pay any rent, low bar. Um, and you let them usually have a room of their own. Usually the addict doesn't have to share with anybody else. And he gets to have lovely, nice, cushy showers and a bed to sleep in and food. Oh, with the bed, the, the shower, you, please understand that you're paying for the hydro. He's probably not paying anything for anything. So when he's hungry, he goes to the kitchen and makes himself something to eat or just get something from the fridge and you're paying for the food that he's eating. And for most addicts, you know, they're sleeping during the day. It's a really low bar, not much is expected of them. Sleeping during the day, using at night, which is when a lot of addicts use. And then guess what? They get the munchies. So they go down the stairs and make noise going down the stairs. Then they go into the kitchen and they start putting stuff together for something for them to eat. And they're 
you know, they don't care that somebody might be asleep in the house at night. So when you wake up, the pots and pans are there, the kitchen is a mess, and guess who's going to clean that up? That's probably going to be you or somebody like you. So that's an example. You know, another example would be an addict who um, got a DUI and isn't had their license taken away and isn't able to drive their car. Maybe the car was taken away. Um, and he comes to you and he says, Mom, I, I need the car. I need the car just for like 10 minutes. I just need to run to the store. Instead of getting into um, an argument with him, instead of having a conflict with him, you say, okay, here are the keys. 10 minutes, 10 minutes. I want you back in 10 minutes. He doesn't come back in 10 minutes. And you know very well what he went to get loaded, you know? So that's the kind of enabling that keep an addict stuck in addiction. And like I say, please understand there are so many ways to enable an addict, but those are some common examples. Helping is, oh, you know what? I wanna say something about enabling first. Um, People enable because they just hate conflict. Many, um, many family members know what an addict can be like when he gets mad. And so you just don't make him mad. You just don't ever do anything to make him mad. This is how enabling keeps an addict stuck in addiction. So when you decide to help, there are things that you as the family member are going to have to overcome. You're basically in recovery too. You need to learn why conflict is so um, hard for you. You need to uh, learn how to set boundaries that are self-respecting, that are good for you to be setting for the addict and for you and for the rest of your family. Helping is when you say to an addict, we love you. We love you enough to say no to you. For example, if you're going to continue using, you are not going to be allowed to live in the family home. You're going to have to find someplace else to live. Dad is going to go, what? This isn't working for me anymore. What's happened to mom? <laughs> you know, but this is the kind of helping that gets addicts to a place where they decide they want help because what they've been doing how they've been enabled isn't working for them anymore. And that, I believe, is the most loving thing you can do for the addict in your life. Saying no to an addict is not a punishment. It's a consequence of their decisions. And you're basically saying to them, I want to see how you handle life. I believe in your resilience. I know I've been doing some things wrong. I know we all have. And so we're getting some help now to learn how to deal with you in the most, in the most loving of ways because we really love you. We want you to have a different kind of life. It really hurts us when you live like this. So if you decide to continue living like this, you're going to have to do it somewhere else. When you're ready, we can review that. We can look at this again. Um, if you're willing to uh, start some counseling, if you're willing to go to school, if you're willing to get a job, 
then maybe you'll be allowed to come live in the family home for a while and um, let, we can see how that goes. But no more low bar. Now we're expecting more of you and we know you can do it and we want you to do it and we love you. This is how you help an addict. This is how addiction stops. And do you want to yeah. add to that, Christine? Yeah. Um, everything Candace has said is obviously spot on about this. And the difference between helping and enabling is kind of like that old saying, give someone a fish and they eat for a day and teach someone to fish and they eat for a lifetime. So enabling is kind of like giving them the fish for the day. And true helping is teaching them how to fish so they can take care of themselves. So you might be solving a, a temporary problem by enabling, but it's not changing the long-term problem. And that's how they stay stuck. That's, right. that's how they stay stuck in addiction. Yeah, that's a great example. Yeah, it is yeah. definitely great. Um, I think it's just important to understand and, and kind of moving along with obviously within the same topic is that you know why are boundaries important and Candace you kind of alluded to some of the boundaries you're setting as examples but maybe if you can explain further can you share a couple of examples of how a family member could set a boundary with an addict in their life yeah in fact we have somebody on this call today and she knows who she is uh, who has been working with me as a client, um, who has a daughter who's been out in the street, uh, who's been just living a terrible life of addiction for quite some time. Um, and, you know, this, this woman, uh, I won't say her name, um, my client, has enabled and has found out that this doesn't help. It doesn't help, it just keeps it going and going and going. Every time she uh, allows her daughter to be abusive with her, which her daughter likes to do because she can get away with it, or she used to be able to get away with it, um, she, you know, every time she did things like that. Every time she tried to help so much, she tried to enable so much, do, do for her daughter all the things that she felt guilty about, you know, or, or felt that maybe her daughter could, could get better if she just tried to help her in an enabling way. It didn't work. Now, my client, it has very clear boundaries about what she will do, what she won't do, whether she can ever come home, you know, and her daughter is at the place of really seriously looking at getting help, which she would not do before. She would not even look at it, you know, when, when her mother um, gave her the message of you need to get some help, the daughter would scream, I don't need help, I just need you to do this for me. Why don't you do this for me? Of course, that didn't work. Now, the daughter is out of place because of these boundaries that my client has set. She's, she's willing to get help. She's, she's telling people at the center that she's at right now, where she's kind of living right now, that she, she wants some help. How can that be a more loving thing to do for the addict? How can you, you know, the boundaries, love with boundaries. We have to love people with boundaries. And doing that is the most loving thing we can possibly do for an addict who's still using. So 
I think that's a great example. It is, and I would just like to read from um, that particular client said, thank God I listened to you. So um, and she also has another question though, as you mentioned, her daughter is currently in a shelter waiting to go into treatment. And she wants to know, is it okay to provide her with a used cell phone so that she can use it for appointments and communications with others, et cetera? Um, yes, I think it would be okay to do that. And um, I don't know that much about cell phone plans, but I would, uh, I would be thinking that you might wanna check that out and have some boundaries, again, some boundaries around the cell phone and what it can be used for. So, um, you know, we don't want to call in your dealer. <laughs> you know, we want, to, we want to be able to stop that from happening. But um, if you can, can get her a very low, um, what am I trying to say, a low pay plan that doesn't have much on it, where all she has is data and she, you know, she, she can, she can call someone. She didn't have a lot of time to look up a lot of stuff on the internet. You know, I would, I would check on what kind of plans are available. It, it, and, and as soon as, if, if this happens, as soon as you find out that she's using it for other things, you take it away. Yeah. Yeah, I think that uh, that makes sense to me too. So uh, once again, boundaries, yeah. right? Um, yep. Yeah. And 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 just know that she's going to yell at you. So what? Yeah. We also had a, a comment from somebody that said, "This is such a deep and important topic. Thank you." So know mm -hmm. that you're being heard. I think that's important for for all of us to know because, you know there's so much love in love with boundaries and I'm so happy that you're seeing that, you know, through these types of, of opportunities. Uh, I have another question. It came in earlier. Uh, my son has suffered from alcohol abuse for 20 years and he is getting worse. How do I know when to help versus enable him? Well, first of all, you don't enable him. You know, the, the, the way you've written the question is how do I know the difference? How do I know when to help and when to enable? You want to be able to help. You want to be able to do the things that will, um, that will really contribute to him coming out of addiction rather than contribute to him staying in addiction. So um, if you're not sure what, what to do and you're not the only one who is not sure what to do. It takes a while to learn this stuff, but if you're not sure what to do, you can work with us for a while. Um, usually we work with people for about three months or so. We specialize in working with the families. We work with people who are on this call. We work with you to change what you're doing so that the addict in your life can have a better chance of recovery, can have a chance of recovery, because if you keep enabling, that won't happen. So, um, you know, it's a great tie in, uh, in a couple of minutes, Christine's gonna talk a little bit about uh, what happens when, when you tell us that you want some help and you have a free 30 minute um, consultation with us. So, the most important thing is that you learn the difference between helping and enabling. And I know that's what you're asking me. We would need, I would need to have more information from you about what you're doing and what you need to stop doing. And I generally find that most people who come to work with us at, at Love With Boundaries, um, they know when they're enabling. They come, they come to us and they say, I know I'm enabling, but, but I don't know what else to do. You know, they know when they're enabling and they know it isn't working. So the fact that you're asking this question may mean that you're ready 
to get some help for you to change what you're doing to help your addict. Mm -hmm. Christine, you're shaking your head that you've heard that a lot, haven't you, in, in these consultations? Yeah. yeah, I really have. And it's, um, you know, it's the difference between, you know, our head and our heart, right? Our head knows what the difference between enabling and helping is. But, you know, our heart sometimes has a hard time buying into what our head says. You know, most of the time when I meet with individuals for a consultation, it's with parents. You know, parents who have adult children who are struggling with addiction. And so as parents, you're torn between your heart. You know, you just love your kids. You want to protect them. You want to take care of them. You want to hug them until they're better again. But your head tells you what I'm doing isn't right. I think I'm keeping them stuck in addiction. But we want to keep them safe and protected. So it's, you know, it's somewhat of a disconnect. So it's bringing the two things together and learning how to teach your loved one to fish. So, you know, that doesn't have to happen anymore. Yeah, great. Um, okay, let's take another. Christine, oh, yeah, let's have one more question and then we'll, we'll turn it over to Christine. Yeah, that's, that's what I was thinking. So I have one more question here. I should have a couple more questions. So I'm trying to, I think we'll just go with this one here. In keeping with enabling, um, how do you gently let a family member know that they are enabling the addict, the addict they love without causing a riff in the family? So this is you seeing somebody else within your family enabling their or your loved one. How do you, how do you approach that topic? Well, I would say that you broach that topic with the same feeling of love that you have toward the addict. It's important to understand that people who enable addicts are struggling inside themselves. So you might say something like, you know, we know that um, Arthur, <laughs> that name just came to me, that Arthur uh, is in active addiction. We know that he's using and drinking and um, I'm, I've just, I've heard, I've, I've been at a webinar and I've heard that, that enabling somebody can keep him stuck in addiction. And I know you don't want to do that with him. I know you love him. I know you want to help him. Um, this may be something that you are interested in learning about because if you keep enabling him, it isn't going to help him. And I, and, and you could probably say to that person, I think you've seen that. <laughs> you've seen that this hasn't really been helping. So I, um, I would say with, with the kind of love in your heart, uh, this is all about love. This isn't about lording it over somebody and, and telling them what they should and shouldn't be doing. And, um, you know, f for the family member to say to, to another family member, you're enabling, it, it, it has, it, it needs to be done with some, with some finesse because the enabler is um, going to want to keep enabling. They're going to want to keep doing that, even though they see that it isn't helping because they hate conflict. They feel guilty you know, all of those reasons for why people do enable. So I would say with, um, with some finesse and some love that you talk to that person and you let them know that what they're doing isn't helping. It's, it's going against help. Yeah. I have one more question. This came in from one of our audience members, so I would like to be able to address that if we could. Um, okay. It says, what about your husband who is living in a home with you? How do I stop enabling him? Obviously, I cannot ask him, um, ask him to my question, sorry. Obviously, you can't, what did she say at the end? Uh, I'm not sure, it came up funny. So it says, obviously, I cannot ask him to my question. So, um, okay. okay. Um, yes, so at Love With Boundaries, we deal 
as Christine said, with a lot of parents who have addicted children, usually adults children. Um, we also deal with, with couples where one part of the couple is addicted and the other part has been enabling or is at the end of their rope. Um, so I don't know, again, I would need more information. I don't know whether you've uh, talked to your husband and let him know that this is not okay and you're not gonna be putting up with it anymore. Those are the kinds of boundaries that we'll teach you and we'll teach you, we'll work with you for how, um, how to language that. But uh, basically you're saying, no, I, I won't take this anymore. This is not what I signed up for. And even if it is what I signed up for back then, I don't want it now. And, and I love you too much to watch you ruin your life every day. I don't want to see it. I don't want to have it anywhere near me. So if you're going to just, if you're going to choose, and I use that word, if you're going to choose to stay in active addiction, there are going to be consequences for that. It, you know, this is not a punishment. I, I'm not trying to punish you, but honestly, I don't want this life. I don't want it for you. So we, teach you how to language that. We teach you how to set the boundaries for that. But no wife needs to put up with that. And it's not good for her husband. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, uh, your response there, well, Candace. You know, it, it just won't stop anything. It, it, it'll okay. keep everything going the way it has been, so. Yeah. And I think this is, you know, this is definitely, as, as Candace mentioned, that um, Love With Boundaries has a free 30-minute consultation where you can provide a little bit more details. And we're going to ask uh, Christine to talk about sort of what people can expect to happen during these sessions. I'm also, at the same time, going to open up uh, a link that should pop up on your screen if you want to go ahead and... Um, you know, submit the questionnaire. So Christine, would you like to yeah. share a little bit about what goes on in one of these consultations? Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Tracy. And thanks, Candace, for all that amazing information. Um, such important information to have. You know, so once you fill out our questionnaire through the Love With Boundaries website, I will receive an email with all your information and be in direct contact with you to set up a 30 minute meeting over Zoom. So the 30 minute consultation is really about information gathering. It's about learning more about you and your family. And it's about you learning about us and how we work. And through that process, we can determine if we'd be a good fit for one another. It's not a counseling session in any way. It's really to get to know each other. And it's somewhat informal. You know, sometimes we joke, have some fun, have some laughs. Um, but what I really want to hear from you is, is why did you reach out? Why did you reach out to us? You know, what's been going on in your life? How has this affected you personally? How has this affected the rest of your family? And how would you like it to change? We talk about, you know, ways that you could have been enabling. Um, we talk about what sort of boundaries you may have already set up in place. And we look at possibilities of how things can be changed. Obviously, we don't dive deep into things, but we look at the situation and how you would like it to be different. And through that process, really discover how to best help your loved one choose recovery. We want to leave you at Love With Boundaries with the sense of confidence that you know how to handle this. You know, so when you sign up with Love With Boundaries and you work with us, you're going to develop that confidence, that self-respect, all those things that you may have lost throughout the years of living with someone with an addiction. And the 30 minute consultation is really to determine whether or not we're the right people to help you get that back again. I've met some incredible families over the last three years that I've been conducting these consultations. And I'll tell you, you know, I've 
seen whole families show up to consultations. Um, I've seen parents show up to consultations. Um, I've seen parents where one person is enabling and the other person has put their firm foot down and they want to be able to meet somewhere in the middle and they just don't know how. And so we talk about that. You know, we're here to help you and you're here to help your loved one and together we'll get there. Yeah, that's great, Christine, thank you. We, we know how to help you at Love with Boundaries. We've been doing this a long time and we know how to help you. One thing that you didn't say is that every once in a while we get a call or an email from somebody who's still using. Mm -hmm. We get an email from an addict who says, I want to stop. I, I'm ready. I'm ready. I, I want some help. And we'll work with them. Usually we work with the families of, of the addicts or the alcoholics. Um, but when an addict is ready, when the family has been working with us and they've done this consultation, they're working with us, they're setting their boundaries, they're doing it with, with a sense of love, but with purpose, you know, firmly. Um, and the addict is kind of saying to himself, this just isn't working for me anymore. I'm not enjoying this so much. Maybe I need to change something. They call us, they let us know that they're ready and we'll work with them too. Sometimes they go elsewhere for help and that's fine, but we will work with addicts when they're ready. Oh, it's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I, I don't, I don't know whether uh, this real, I don't know whether you said this, Tracy, in the introduction, um, but I am 37 years clean and sober. And I uh, just celebrated that in July. And um, that was after a 15 year, really painful addiction to opioids that were prescribed to me for Crohn's disease. So it's kind of like once you've got Crohn's, you got it, you know? Um, even when you're ready to not have it anymore, you still have it. So I had doctors giving me all these medications, morphine and codeine and Deverol and all this, all this Oxycontin stuff that I took for 15 years and then wanted to kill myself. So I understand what the addicts go through. Christine has been clean and sober for seven, is it seven years? That's right. Um, seven years. I mean, this, we know how awful a life of addiction is. We know what it's like to be in active addiction. We don't want that for your son, your daughter, your husband, your wife. We don't want that for you. We don't want it for them. And we can help you get out of it forever done. So we hope that you, if you haven't already um, filled in a questionnaire and, and um, you know, if you think you're ready, now is the time to take that next step. Definitely worth having that chat with, with Christine or potentially Alina, who's not with us here today, but um, just take that step, right? A step forward, a step towards uh, setting those boundaries, a step towards the life that you're meant to live. And if you're not ready today, that's okay. I mean, it takes, it takes some people a while to get to being ready. If, if you're not ready, keep the link somewhere safe. Um, you can always get it on, on the lovewithboundaries.com uh, website anyway, if you lose it, but it's okay not to be ready today. But I will tell you that if you continue to enable and you don't learn the difference between helping and enabling, things will never get better. We have a saying, 
that if nothing changes, nothing changes. And as soon as something changes, a lot can change. But if you are ready, if you feel like you're ready, we're here for you.